I don't know what to say. I don't have any prepared speech. When Artie Hutchinson called me and asked if I could attend the awards ceremony for the best essay celebrating the 100 years of the Saline County Wheat Growers Association, I hardly expected this. I have no idea what to say because I already pointed out in the essay that Saline County and its wheat production is a fine example of what makes America great, those amber waves of grain. We are blessed to be living in this country of ours, breadbasket to the world, production center of hard red wheat, high in protein and strong in gluten. Saline County is a fine example of American can-do. 20,000 wheat farmers in Kansas, over 3 million bushels of wheat, over a billion dollars in value. It's no wonder that people around the world look to us as an inspiration. On my way here, I swung by my mom's because, as some of you know, She's been feeling a little off lately. My dad's passing last year was hard on her, but there she was, out in the flower garden. I have to hand it to you folks, how you kept this a surprise. She wasn't gonna let on that she knew there was an award. I almost fell over when I opened the envelope just now and saw the check. I thank you from the bottom of my heart and assure you that this money is going to a good cause, namely, my daughter's college fund. My daughter has her mind set on becoming a scientist. Bless her heart. She thinks she's going to make a discovery that'll change the world, especially since she found out that her grandma has celiac disease. She says she's going to find a cure, and you have to give her credit for believing in something I know some of y'all have lost faith in, namely science. Not that I mean to bring up a sore point, but it's easy to understand how my daughter was upset when she saw her grandma getting sick. I know that there are some people who think celiac disease is all in the mind, but it's no joke with the diarrhea, fatigue, and weight loss. You just look at my mom and you know she's not feeling right. I didn't mean to get off the subject because we're all fortunate here, excuse me, to be in the American heartland. Without any of those ideas we hear from some of the supposedly better educated folks to the east and west of us, when that east coast educated doctor told her she was going to have to cut out the wheat in her diet, it went against everything she believes in. She's been baking bread for going on 60 years, and her first reaction was to walk out of that doctor's office if he was telling her that what her family's been doing for generations was making her sick. I didn't intend to say any of this, and I suppose I shouldn't have, except that it was on my mind since just before I left my mom, she told me that she's been throwing up, and now she has skin blisters on her elbows and knees, and the doctors keep telling her it's on account of the gluten in her diet. She said, God damn, if I hadn't known that doctor's father was a wheat farmer, I would have slapped him across the mouth. I can see Artie giving me the eye that I better wrap it up. I know those women from the First Methodist Church have cooked up a wonderful lunch for y'all, and I can smell the fresh-baked Parker House rolls made from the best Kansas wheat. Again, my thanks to y'all for this prize, and I hope for goodness sakes I haven't spoiled your appetite with my distractions. I really didn't intend for it to come out quite like this. Please enjoy your lunch. I have never seen it, except in paintings, and never heard it, except in traveler's tales. But my heart beats faster when I think of it, or read its many names on a map. I long for the sea. I have been too long surrounded by fields in this landlocked midland sameness. I yearn for surf and craggy cliffs unknown. I'm sick of dirt, dust, earth, humus, loam, bog, turf, clay, soil, sod, sand, silt. 
Fields, parcels, plots, collops, holdings, acres, hectares. And of what they beget. Grass, weeds, moss, ivy, nettles that sting, thorns that prick. This place my parents chose has no river, no loch, hardly a trickle from a stream. It stinks like decay. The landscape is flat, still, fecund of weeds, sterile of imagination. Where is the drama? In what patch can a dreamer stand? It yields no visions. It prompts no stories, nor verse, nor songs. It lacks harbor fog, of which I've heard. The mist's tiny drops in the arc of candlelight, ocean breezes whirling them like motes of dust in a sunbeam. It offers mere practicality, sustenance, responsibility, labor. On the sheer cliffs of undulating coasts, one can stand and gaze. Let dreams wash over you. Breathe the salty air that has not touched nor known the soil. The colors of the sea form a multicolored vista. Deep blues, gentle turquoise, greens and grays, ornamented with knots of white foam in ceaseless motion, bobbing up, down, rolling in, out. The sea itself can sing like me, change its tune like me. It can be soft and quiet, it can rock you, gentler than your mother's arms. Roar and scream, wreak havoc, wreck ships, reshape coastlines, raise walls and houses. For I have tempests and depths within me, not seen on the surface. I am the boiling water, Buck in the slight pot lid. I am a buried ocean. I. Are you iron? There are no poems. I think these editors would at least have some respect for paper. It's one thing if they don't want my poems, but to send them back all wrinkled, it's rude. One of them even added a note. Your description of soap bubbles in sunlight is nice, but meaningless. Meaningless? This guy would know a metaphor if it hit him over the head. Then he had the nerve to say, do you know Allen Ginsberg's poem, Howl? Send us something like that. Honestly. What happened to the baked ham? There was half a ham in here yesterday. I came to the baby. Why? I need a room for my novel. A man should not come home and find his wife ironing poems. He should not find a manuscript in the refrigerator instead of the baked ham. What am I supposed to eat? You can order something to a freezer so you could put that stuff in it. There's no more room in the freezer and it's not stuff. This is the first draft of my novel. Bucky was a baby when I wrote it. I realized today I gotta protect everything I've written, not just the poems. Do they really need protecting? But the house burns down. I don't wanna lose my room. This house isn't going to burn down. We 
No, not what tomorrow may bring. I can't eat your novel for supper. There's Johnson's in the freezer. Or, or we could go out. I'm tired of going out. My mother always made a nice supper. Ah, well. Your mother wasn't an artist. Life of the artist is different. You still don't understand that. If you had something to show for your artist's life, maybe I would. I know. I know you were named North Georgia Poet of the Year, and you got a poem published. But what else? Yeah. Here's what I have to show for it. Okay. Forget it. No, I won't forget it. These poems are my life. I can remember a time when you ironed my shirts. Laundry does a much better job of your shirts than I ever did. Didn't give it a thought back then, but now they would feel taken care of. How was your day? We got an interesting new client. A young fella who says he's an atheist wants to register as a conscientious objector. Did you tell him you're a veteran? No, I wouldn't want to fight in Vietnam either. Well, I guess atheists have a conscience too. Mm -hmm. Will he win his case? Mm -hmm. Not here, <laughs> but he's willing to go after an appeal. Then you never know. It's a strange time we're living in. How was your day? I thought about adverbs today. Sometimes I think they're the enemy of good writing. You try to resist them, but they creep up on you so exquisite, so right, that the battle is lost. <laughs> Relentlessly. Threateningly. Thrillingly. Sometimes I wish adverbs didn't exist. I can't keep on like this. You're being dramatic, Tom. We have our understanding. You can have your other woman as long as you come home every night. I've been patient. It's been two years since I filed for divorce. I'm tired of waiting. All you have to do is sign this paper and the divorce will be final. You have to sign no, it. No, I don't. Marion. <laughs> Tom, take the long view. Right now you're unhappy, but you think changing wives is going to make you happy. Don't be so short-sighted. We got married in college way too young. But look at the life we created. 29 years together. Two wonderful children. We're part of the community. You're a deacon, a mason. I run the writers' club. We're recognized, respected, a highly respected family. I don't want that taken away from me. We haven't touched each other in years. We don't love each other. The long view, Tom. Take the long view. We were happy once. We were ignorant and naive. We were happy. So we grew apart and that happens. Now you're feeling restless. You feel life is passing you by. Well, that's what life does. It passes us all by. And then we'll be 80 years old and we'll have each other. We'll have grandkids and great-grandkids, and you'll have me to take care of you. I mean, you'll be thankful, and uh, you'll be happy again. I may not live to be 80. I could fall over dead tomorrow. Do you think you'll live the next 30 years alone? I would hope not. Right. You'd find somebody else. Mary and I... I can't share your dream about this future we'll never have. I don't believe in it. It's your fantasy. And what is your fantasy? Being part of a couple that cares deeply about each other, that surprises each other, that shares the same values. Somebody you love being in bed with. It won't be much longer till the state legislature approves no-fault divorce. You might as well sign it. I can't. Tom, you don't know what it's like for single women. Divorced women. People think you're pathetic. 
Some women think you want to steal their husbands. And how am I supposed to support myself? You'll get alimony. Oh, great. We both get to live like grad students. No more nice big house. I'm thinking of uh, joining a private law firm. That way, we'd be comfortable. I see. I never thought I'd see you in a private law firm. You'd do that for her? We can't work in the same office. It, it, it's easier for me to get another job. Are you going to marry her? I don't know that she'll have me. You agreed not to smoke in the kitchen. Sorry. I forgot. Tom, whatever you think of me, I really do have your best interests at heart. When I say this, it's because I care about you. You can't marry a colored woman. It's been legal for two years now. The law has nothing to do with it. We're still in Georgia. No one will speak to you again. Maybe, maybe not. Atlanta's becoming a big city. All kinds of people are moving here. People who care nothing about country clubs and SEC football and church on Sunday. It will be a different sort of person, but plenty will speak to me. And you seem to think it's, it's all my choice. It's really her decision. I'm not sure she's willing to take a chance with me. You've been seduced, Tom. Blinded. Blinded by the thrill, the glory of this civil rights work. You feel heroic, the white knight rescuing. Well, I guess it's not a fair lady. I should be the fair lady. I should be sequestered in a tower high in the clouds, guarded by a fire-breathing dragon waiting for the hero to liberate me. It sounds impossible, but it's not. Not really. Are you done? This is not the life I expected. I dreaded being a rich lawyer's wife. The bridge punch, the junior league, the tennis clubs. When you decided not to join your father's law firm, I was so happy and so relieved. And I admired you. Working for the Justice Department was honorable admirable and we'd have a good life and I wouldn't have to be the perfect wife. You would have been fine in the junior league. You really don't know me by now, do you? What do they know about poetry, about art, about all that matters to me? Your signature. I can't. I think you know why. These poems mean everything to me. I don't want to be married to a man who destroys art. Hi there, um, Polly calling, just in case you didn't recognize the voice. Uh, just called to tell you that your hat is here and uh, is being well cared for.
and is uh, sitting on top of the piano so it won't be sat on or have coffee spilled on it. <laughs> um, I know it's a special hat seeing as you bought it in Italy and it has some special memories with, I think you said, with some woman who cooked for you. And it's just a very nice hat. <laughs> and, and you look quite debonair in it, I must say. Well, the hat is here and is looking well. Um, if you can say such a thing about a hat, I'm very happy to have the hat for a while since it reminds me of what a nice evening we had, even if I had one too many glasses of wine. And you have to admit that you were encouraging and I was resisting, although probably not too much. Well, the, the hat reminds me of you and of some of the things that you said last night. I don't think I've laughed so much in such a long time. Just looking at your hat with a smile on my face and I, well, I know that my imagination is running away with me a little bit, but the hat seems to be smiling back at me. You seem to be a man of real sensitivity and that is something that I appreciate, seeing as so few men, seeing as so many men seem to be indifferent to feelings. I mean, the few men that I know who express their feelings express it in terms of their, their cars or their grandfather's rifles. <laughs> but uh, a hat is a delicate thing. Subject to the wind and the rain and getting lost or forgotten when something new appears on the horizon. But I'm getting carried away again. Um, I always do. And I hope it doesn't offend you, but it's in my nature, you see, to worry that things said might be forgotten and that promises made were not made in earnest. No one wants to be a forgotten hat. <laughs> Ah, uh, there. I've said it, and you'll probably hate me for it, but I can't help it. I'm sorry, I always ruin everything. Just when things seem to be coming up roses, I have to. I managed to bring out the flamethrower. But your hat, um... I wasn't lying when I said what a nice hat it was, all symbolism aside. And I even tried it on. And even though it's a little bit big on me, I think I looked rather stylish in it. <laughs> Gave me kind of like a tough girl look, especially with the cigarette. I'm wearing it right now, in fact of you. If you want it, uh, we can talk. Ciao, Bello. This is a monologue. Just me, one actor, that's what COVID-19 has reduced us to. One actor, one speaker, and one Zoom frame. So, just me. <laughs> but I, I just want to say, I believe in other people. I believe that you are out there. I believe that you exist. I remember you. I miss you. I was raised on the Christian uh, creeds, the Apostles' Creed, uh, the Nicene Creed. You know, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe it as opposed to knowing it. But something I believe more deeply, more based on my own experience, is that other people exist. I mean, 
I exist, I, of that I'm sure my consciousness, my own consciousness, my own limited consciousness. Now, <clears throat> I know that that's real. Just exactly what I am, I don't know. Or, uh, as the Beatles put it, with Ringo's unmistakable everyman voice, like, what do you do when you turn out the lights? I can't tell you, but I know it's mine. So that's, that's what I know. Consciousness. And I believe that other people exist. Now, you, <clears throat> you could be a, a movie that someone's, uh, projecting on my wall, you know, a, a doctored photo, fake news. What you are, I don't know. But I believe, I believe that you exist. And so now it's time for a value judgment. I'm glad you exist. <laughs> well, mostly, most of the time, most of you. I mean, what else did Ringo say? Uh, I get by with a little help from my friends. That's us. Humanity in, in, in a nutshell. The two things, alone and together. In one way, individuals uh, in isolated Zoom boxes, one at a time, wearing masks to protect one another. This is one big internet connection available to everybody. So now, all right, <clears throat> I'd like to put all this into a creed. I believe that you have a, a consciousness like mine, feelings like mine, goals and confusions like mine, successes, failures, sins, crimes, all that, but through it all, a life like mine, precious, limited, temporary. And I believe that, that what goes around comes around. I, I believe we should treat each other the, the way we want to be treated. I believe we should give the other person a break. I believe we are all in this together. Life, society, New York, the virus. We'll get through this.